All right, Shalom Rastafari. What we wanted to do here is actually do an introduction to um, the Shroud of Torin, looking at and examining the Shroud of Torin. Now, what we want to clarify is that in doing these particular uh, vids, we are not seeking to say or claiming that his Imperial Majesty Kadamawi Haile Selassie is Jesus. Even though many people say, well, that's hard to believe because you make comparisons with his majesty with Christ. But part of the confusion that is imagined by many is due to a lack of firm teaching in the Bible and in the true um apostolic doctrine and the true foundation upon the Hebraic foundation because a lot of Gentile, we're in the Gentile form of whitewashed Christianity which has misinterpreted many foundational principles such as the fact that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father but they are one and they reflect one and the other. What you're looking at right now on the left-hand side is actually um, what we call the Ethiopic Jesus or Jesus, or more correctly, Jesus, Jesus Christos, is the Ethiopian illumination of what Christ looked like both at that time and in from the Ethiopic, uh, we, we could say theology or Tawahido, from the Tawahido teaching. Now we find this particular Iesus or this particular image of Jesus to be most consistent with the authentic representation from an Ethiopian or a black Hebrew and black Jewish perspective. Now, of course, many people would look at this image on the on the left and would say, well, that's Haile Selassie. And we say, yes, it is the image of the Father, but actually it's the image of the Son. And this is one of the foundational teachings of true Christianity, is, is the mystery of, of God in Christ, the mystery of the Father and Son. Now, on the left-hand side, what you see is um, a bronze... Um, life-size um, re you could say recreation of what the person that whose image is on the shroud of Torin would have looked like and very interestingly enough it was um, it was created it was created by the Vatican or the, or the Romanists but then once they created it we heard that it's been like kind of hid away and it's off on the on, on the side. It's not prominently displayed. Now, if you can see the image clear enough, and let's get this uh, picture right here. Let's see if we can open this as well. This is another related image of the individual. We have actually a video. It was played on Fox, on Fox, um, a special on Fox News, and he played it like one time, and. Thanks be to the King of Kings and his Christ who's able to get a copy of it. But since then, just like the, the image, this particular is, is a life-size recreation of what the, using computer and science, so forth and so on, of what the person, which is believed by many Christians, on the Shroud of Torin would have looked like. And let's bring up this picture here. This is a... This is a good picture right here to begin this off. Now, okay, we have to clear up some memory here. This is some related, some related matters that we want to share. Um, so let's get into this. Let's uh, we'll clear this up. We'll bring this. This is from a related teaching, just so we can open this and show a brief comparison of what we're speaking about and how this individual. Who was pictured? Who was pictured on the shroud of Torin, whom some say is Jesus Christ, and who others say this image is a fraud. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a um, middle age, um, during the medieval ages, uh, for, forgery made to 
um, full so-called Christians, but there's been a lot of testing. There's been a lot of um, examination of this. And based on everything that we have seen and, and gone over concerning this shroud image, it appears that this is a, a genuine, this is based on genuine truth concerning the resurrection and concerning Gitachi Nam and Hanatachi Jesus Christos. But what most of all is interesting is that the image of the the person on the shroud of Torah, when we look at this image, we see an image of his imperial majesty. You know, the world would say, oh, that's a, that's a, that, that's a dead ringer. You understand? We wouldn't say a dead ringer, but if you will, we see an image of his imperial majesty. You understand? In that particular image. Even here, it is very clear. And this is an overlay of what's called the, the Pantocrata the Pantocrator. Um, it's an early image. What's so very interesting is that in one of the Shroud um, films that we have, they went about to um, make a comparison. So they chose a particular, like, uh, a Roman Catholic favorite picture of, of Jesus. And they said that this was taken from St. Catherine's Monastery. But then we also have this, and if I'm correct, this is the Pantocrator, a black and white, a side-by-side -side comparison to his imperial majesty. And they say that this image, basically, is the same as this particular image. But, of course, this is an artist's rendition. Now, as we start to look at some of the, the, the older pictures of his imperial majesty, what we see is, and we compare this, we see that the image on the shroud, actually resembles his imperial majesty let's uh bring this up if we can Do we have room to bring this up hopefully we'll have some so we have this right here we did a black and white a reverse now they say that this particular individual here is a caucasian male we saw this in one of the documents that it's caucasian male now people some people will look at it and just from an untrained eye or a so-called post-racial eye, you know, with white supremacy and the stereotyping of black people and the, mis the miseducation of the Negro, this might look like a European image to some. Because they say that only Europeans have these features and black people have those features. But interestingly enough, concerning the Ethiopians, they call the Ethiopians actually a... Um, a Caucasian, a dark-skinned Caucasian people. Now, it, it is so clear when we look at this image right here, the image of his majesty. And what's interesting is the hair. If you notice the hair right here, the hair is matted like dreadlocks, if you notice. This is all based on the computer-generated and, and, and the artist in bronze recreation of this full-bodied, this full-bodied image from the Shroud of Turin. And after they created this particular bronze, they displayed it a couple of times, and it's like we said, it's at the Vatican. It's been displayed a couple of times. But since then, it's actually kind of been like put up on the side. You know, the Vatican, they have a broad uh, uh, a library and collection, you know, of art and facts from all over the world and especially many different um, cultures that some say they exterminated or brought under under the Roman the Roman sea. So we have a couple of pictures here that actually this is a, a full body as well. This is a full body. So they call the Ethiopians, okay, they call the Ethiopians, they call them dark-skinned Caucasians. They also call them, the Europeans, that is, also call the Ethiopians um, Aryans. There's a video that we have that's based on 1940s, 50s, you know, uh, Eurocentric scholarship. And at that time, they were referring to the Europeans as dark-skinned Caucasians and as dark-skinned Aryans. So that idea that the individual on the shroud of Torin does not exclude an Ethiopian. 
in particular using his imperial majesty as the best Katamari Haile Selassie as the best example of this. Um, in particular, we have documentation from the time of his imperial majesty, the, the, the uh, visual manifestation of the king of kings among the sons of men being called a European, being called a Caucasian, and so forth and so on, where some people actually took his imperial majesty for being a European. And when we look at a wide range of pictures and stills of his imperial majesty, it's very clear that his imperial majesty was far from being a European. But we have to recall that under a white racist regime of white supremacy and a lot of misconceptions that have been put forward regarding race and racial identity, it's... Um, it should be no surprise or no wonder that such misconceptions would become broadly um, circulated. So let's let's bring up another comparison, one more comparison. Um, we have some better actual comparisons as well, but in us putting this forward, even this, this is not to say that we're saying that Haile Selassie the first is Jesus because the Father is the Father and the Son is the Son, but they are one in spirit and in truth. Once again, this is a good, this is a good example of um, what we mean right here. You understand, of the, though the, the pictures are not in the proper um, ratio side by side, but the prominent features we can see within the three-dimensional image and even the height of it, I think, was interesting. They try to say 5'11", but some say perhaps it, it, it from 5'6", maybe 5'5", five, five to 5'11". You know, this is based on the, the various different scientific estimations of what the individual pictured on the Shroud of Torin, what his height would actually be. So we're doing this in anticipation of going into a teaching on the Shroud of Torah and as well as bring forward that History Channel um, video that they played at least one time concerning the Shroud of Torah and getting to some of the other documentary out there about the Shroud of Torah and comparing it from an Ethiopic perspective. So once again, this is we want to sum up here with the Pantocrator, because even Christ in his mysteries, when he talked about that you will see me and you will not see me, and he starts to speak of the Father, he's speaking of the Son bearing witness of the Father, Christ coming to bear witness of the Father, because the Son is Lord of Lords, and the Father, of course, is King of Kings. That's when you have a proper um, comprehension of these biblical and divine um, mon um, monarchical titles. You see, when it says that King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it's saying the Father and Son as one. But the Son is Lord. He is Lord of all lords. And his Father, our Father, is King of all kings. And they, in spirit and in truth, is one. This is why Christ says if we stay in his word, and, and and he will sup with us. The Father will sup with us. The Son will sup with us, as he is one with the Father. And if we are one in His Word, His Spirit, and His Truth, that they would be one with us, so that we all can be one in spirit and in truth. So we have to interpret the theology properly, and as well as metaphysically. So here from Saint Catherine's Monastery is one of the oldest and the best preserved and most well-known works. And it's a painted icon of Jesus or Yeshua, called in Greek the Pantocrator, meaning the all-sovereign or the ruler of all. This painting would remain virtually unknown until fairly recently when allegedly when, when, when allegedly discovered and examined by archaeologist George Soterio in 1930. Now, let's, uh, let us note for the record that it's 1930 that witnessed the coronation of Negus Tafari 
Negus Teferi as Kedamawi Haila Selassie as Moa and Bessa Zaim Negeda Yehuda Kedamawi Haila Selassie Siyuma Egezi Abiher Negus Neges Ze In 1930. So this particular painting that you see on the left was actually uh, discovered and re, in a sense, exhibited in 1930 and it's one of the oldest and the best preserved um, paintings or icons of Jesus Christ of Jesus Christos so it is widely believed that that it is upon the Pantocrator is upon this very image that we we're showing you that nearly all existing Christ images are and we'll add more or less Based, the icon is over 1500 years old. St. Catherine's is located deep in Egypt's Sinai Desert, and this monastery was built in 330 AD, right around the time of the persecutions of the early church before the introduction of the other Jesus or the other Christ and the and the other gospel and the other spirit, this this um, mystery Babylon before the rise of the Romanist church. So many who um, were these monks were preserving some of the ancientcy of Christianity because they recognized that the Antichrist was already in the world. So it is kind of interesting that this image here matches in, in the basic idea and sense, the image that we have on the Shroud of Torah, and as well as the three-dimensional um, bronze statue, and that this image also matches the express image of the father of modern Africa and of Ayanai, the Rastafari, Kadamawi, Haile Selassie, as well as, and let's just bring this right here, as well as, there we see the Ancient of Days, as the Ethiopian, the indigenous representation and the indigenous imagery of the Ethiopian Christos or the Ethiopian Christ. Now, if you go to Ethiopia, you look up Ethiopian art, there are many different um, stylizations that were introduced later on, but when we go to the authentic and the, and, and the original Images, indigenous images that were faithful from the time of the Ethiopian eunuch that we have in Acts of the Apostles, it all bears witness to this basic imagery, which also is a direct expression and a reflection of Haile Selassie I. So, once again, we see what Christ meant in his parables concerning the likeness of the Father to the Son and the Son to the Father. There's one more image. Let's just close that up for a moment and just bring up this other image right here as well. This particular image, well, let's bring the comparison. This is also very interesting here as well to present this particular comparison right here. And you've probably seen this in some of the other videos. What we're showing is that the Son, Jesus Christos, is true, and the Father, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, is true, and they both bear witness to one and the same good news and message, a message of salvation for those who repent and come out of Babylon, as well as judgment for the evildoers. So here again, we have another form of this. This is called a Veronica or Veron, Veronica, which means a, a, a true icon. This is one reason why it was called the Veronica. Some stories have been made as well about somebody named, a woman named Veronica, so forth and so on. But really, some of those are just stories. The real reason why it's called the Veronica is because it was the true image. It's because even at that time, and even in the, gospel, in the epistles of Paul, he says how Christ is clearly um, exhibited, really clearly portrayed, and if you look at the words behind that, I think it's in Galatians, um, clearly portrayed crucified. So even in the time of the Apostle 
um, Paul or Paulos. Do we have, I believe in, was it, is it Galatians? I think it's Galatians. Let's see if we have have a couple of moments to just go up there real quick, bring up the the, the software right here and go through a search because we prefer to show it to you because what we're saying is that the whole imagery of Christ and the imagery, you know, the paintings and other um, what are called icons go all the way to the apostolic time if not before then. You remember when Christ had transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration and they said that their talking with the Moshiach was um, Moshe, Musa, Moses, as well as was Elijah. How would they know um, Moses and Elijah unless there were certain paintings? And a painting is not an idol, you know, just because one's had paintings of their loved ones. It wasn't that they was worshiping their loved ones as God, but keeping this as as a as a as a memorial for the children to know who they are. It's like you have pictures of your family. You're not worshiping the pictures of your family. And you're not saying that they are 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 God in that sense. You know what I'm saying? But hopefully they are children of God. Otherwise, you know, they're effed or or cursed. You know, so this is why repenting is so very important, especially in the time that we're living. But here, what a Galatia Sawoch Miraf source. And this one verse right here where Bamarinya in the Amharic it says, Yeah, Matas Tolu, Ye Galatia Sawochoi, but I not you feet, Jesus Christos in the Tesek Alehono, Teshlo Neber, Leune Tendata Tazazu, Azia Azim, Yadere Gavachu, Mano, O foolish Galatians. Or, or y'all who don't comprehend, don't understand, ye matas tolu, ye galatia soochoi, who hath bewitched you? Who hath, like, hoodwinked and bamboozled you? Who, who hath um, bewitched you, King James says, that ye should not obey the truth? Not just that you should not know the truth. This is the key right here, but the scriptures call for an obedience and obedience to the truth. Obey the truth. Obey the Wengel. Obey the good news. Not just accept it. It's true, you know, but do you obey it? Before whose eyes, Jesus Christo, speaking to them, hath been evidently set forth. This is the interesting thing when you study the scriptures. Here it says evidently. You know, like almost like in a legalistic but legal sense, making an argument evidently set forth, it says, crucified among you. Now, everybody focus on, okay, how was Jesus Christo set forth before them crucified? Unless they had some sort of a, a, a painting. And what we're going to find, let's just close this up for a moment. You know what I'm What we're going to find is that there was such a setting forth of Jesus Christos before them. Let's bring up our um, our exhibit right here, see if we can find this. Um, where, and when we get into the Word, let's, here we go. When we get into the Word, now, no doubt when Christ was crucified, you understand, when the Moshiach was crucified, you know, these pictures tend to introduce a certain type of a, a, a modesty, that actually wasn't that actually wasn't there in that particular sense that when Christ was crucified it was more like this you understand it was more without that so-called false modesty but you know Christians and others would put at least a loin cloth you know in that sense a loin cloth over him so the senses don't get too riled up and everything we just show that to you and let's move forward now right here is a painting even though like we said there there, there was not you know that sense remember in the beginning adam and and haywan they were naked and they did not know shame until they ate of what they shouldn't have eaten so really the godliness does not have a problem with the nudity. But today in, in the fallen world and counterfeit Christianity, they do. 
you know, because of the perverseness of, of the mind or mindlessness of the system of things that we are in. So right here, Bamarinya, let's just go through this right here. So let's bring up the verse. Let's bring up the verse right here. And we have the verse in the Emperor's Bible or Hala Selassie, Metaf Kedus, right here. And then we have King James Version, right, side by side. And then we're going to go into the Strong's Numbers. And the word we're going to look at right here is this interesting phrase, hath been evidently set forth. Now, Bamarinya, in the Amharic, when it says that, are you not true feet, Jesus Christos, in the Tesekele Hono, Teslo Neber? Most Ethiopians probably would say Teslo, but since that's a Nugusu Se, or Nugusu She, in the Gutters, it was Tesh. It was a Tesh. It, it, was a, it was that sort of a sound, like a SH or a highly syllabated sound. Tesh, Tesh. Teshlo. And Teshlo, Teshlo comes from the Ethiopic word to paint. But now in King James, he uses the expression, hath been evidently set forth. It must, be, it must have been great Shakespearean right then. Not too bad, but it kind of hides the root of what it's really about. That's why the Bible says to study and show yourself approved. So here we have the Greek 4270, Greek because we're in the New Testament, Hebrew when we in the Old Testament. When we click on the 4270, let's see what the strong Hebrew and the Greek dictionary, what that brings up to us. That says... Um, they have right here prographo. Prographo sounds interesting. It says from to write previously figuratively to announce, prescribe, be ordained, evidently set forth. They giving you even now here at this level, they're giving you an idea, but not the correct idea because people still think that it it, it is um how can you say something that's written. He said, you have it clearly pictured to you. Because remember, many of the pictures that were used, even from the ancient world, were hieroglyphic symbolic examples. So both being word and image. Now, when we get into this, it says to grave, especially to write figuratively. They're not telling you to draw, because then it's describe. When we get to grapho, in other words, be graphic. Be graphic about it. So what could be more graphic for early Christians and and early black Hebrews and, and, and Gentiles who were hearing the gospel message to see this sort of a picture of Christ set forward and set forth among them clearly crucified, clearly crucified, when the actual imagery was more like this, you understand, without any false sense of Modesty. The Romans wasn't saying, hey, we'll let you keep your shorts on and everything. No, it, w it was to humiliate the, the, the lawbreaker, you see, because when they gave Christ up to be crucified by the Romans, it was for a crime of treason, of declaring himself king, declaring himself to be setting up a new monarchy. And this now brings us to another level of teaching that now continues the true biblical story. Because why did they crucify Christ? They crucified Christ because they said that he was a man calling himself God, but that was religious. That was the Jews' problem. So what those um, Uncle Tom um, Negroes, because they were, they were niggas, they were black folks, you know, saying predominantly, because he came to his own and his own did, did not receive him. This is, a, this is a, a sinful state of mind. This is the reason why his majesty also, in that sense, went through a political sort of a crucifixion, even among his own people as well. That's why the light of Rastafari, although it originated in the East, it had to shine to the West. It had to shine to us who were in the diaspora, you understand, to be heard by a people that were no people. We were no people then, you understand, until the illumination of the King of Kings and his Christ. So we see the part of the same story right here with his majesty now, the King of Kings upon the throne of David, the throne of Jehovah. How could Rome 
fascist, mystery Babylon, Vatican, Rome, how could they tolerate or abide that? And now that leads up now to the fascist invasion of Ethiopia to destroy the lion of the tribe of Judah, just like ancient Rome sought to destroy the Lamb of God. So the Lamb of God referring to the Son and the line of the tribe of Judah referring to the Father. So in this scripture here, you understand, because they're not giving you the full meaning right here in the Greek. You know, they're trying to leave it all Greek. But when we look at this word right here, this expressed right here, inda tesekele hono teshlo neba. When we look at these words here concerning Jesus Christos, it's clearly telling us from the kings and Maharik, it's clearly telling us that they had a visual imagery, a visual representation of Christ being crucified. And hence we have this ancient type of what they would call um, iconography. We have this ancient type of iconography and these actual ancient images such as this Catherine one from Catherine's monastery, and even the Shroud of Turin that we began this brief uh, lecture update, a preview actually, a preview to what we um, hope and pray to present forward concerning the Shroud of Turin, how the Shroud of Turin actually vindicates the Rastafari claims. The claims of Ainai as Rastafari are vindicated actually by the Shroud of Torin. Let's see if we can bring this up one more time. Like we said, this is the three-dimensional. This is the three-dimensional likeness that the Roman church made to, to see what this man would look like that they claim is, is the Christ and the image of the Christ. And they did it in bronze, too. And like we said, if you notice, let's show you this right here. The video is interesting because the video, they give you a three-dimensional, not three-dimensional, but they go around it so you can get to see more or less the size of the individual. And the size appears to be a size similar to Haile Selassie I as well. But it's clear that this individual has matted here. I mean, this is one of the most interesting. Let's see if we can zoom in in for those maybe watching this on video so you can see this a little bit clearer. This is one image here. Look at the mattedness. You know, it's like the Nati, what I and I would call the Nati. And then look at this closer image of the image of Christ from the Shroud of Torah. And look at the face, the facial features, the facial type. You know, um, I mean, even this area of the face here, when you look at this and you look at some of the um, pictures of his majesty, you know what I'm saying, the mature images of his imperial majesty, not the youthful ones, but the more mature one. You see this bone right here, too, you know, the, the cheekbones, the nose the mouth, the lips, the posture of the... And then look at the hair when we compare it with the Abu Kadus, the images of Abu Kadus and the uh, Gwendala or the Nati. You understand? You can clearly see that this is matted. Although some would say, oh, that's just the blood. That's the drying up of the blood right there. It's clearly when you look at this, you can see that these are dreadlocks. So no doubt when the, when the, when the papists saw this, and recognize exactly, you know, who they were looking at, they immediately hid it away from them. <laughs> you know, they immediately hid this. This is an image of his majesty. You, you know, when they talked about that his majesty's body was found, this is the sort of image that they should have showed the world if their claims were true. But when we look at even this image, this image no doubt testifies to Hyla Selassie, but then they would say, well, this is a three-dimensional of the man's image from the Shroud of Torah, which they believe to be Yeshua HaMoshiach, Adonai, believed to be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But yet, when you look at this image, you can clearly see this is an image of Hyla Selassie I. 
but no doubt, because once again, let's refer to the scriptures right here to rightly divide the word of truth. So you get this Galatian 3 and 1. Galatians 3 and 1 is clearly saying that even in the time of the apostle, in the time of the apostle um, Paul, which was, say, some, it was right, really right after that time. Some say it was a couple of years out, but it was right during that particular period of time, you know, as the time of Christ um, and his ascension, that they had visual images because no doubt people had artistic skills and drew paintings and pictures. There was nothing sinful about it. That's only in a Gentile Western um, misconception and misunderstanding. So let's just go right here to show that the, the son is the express image of the father and therefore the father would be the express image of the son. And this is one of the reasons why the indigenous images of Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, from Ethiopian Christian tradition, it is a likeness, bears a likeness, what they would call a dead ringer, what they would call a dead ringer, Yehovah said, but um, he who is dead and behold is alive and live forevermore, for of his imperial majesty. So here in what Ibrawian or the epistle to the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, we have it written where it says, Besamah Wulman says, Kedus, Hadwamlak, it says, Katint, Jemro, Egziali, Her, Bebizu, Oinetina, Bebizu, Agodana, Labatochachina, Benbiatina, Gro. God, or the sustainer, Yod, He, Wow, He, Yahweh, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, in many different ways, Bebizu, Oinetina, in many, at, at, at many, um, in many likenesses, Bezu Godana, and in many ways, spake in time past to the fathers, or spoke from the first time. Katint Jemro means starting from the Zatepi, what the Egyptians call the Zatepi, or the first time. Katint Jemro. He spoke to the fathers, right? Right, in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Hulun, Warasha Badarago, Degmo, Alamatina, Befet Arabetta, Beliju, Bezia Zemin, Mach Arasha, Lenya Tanagaren. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. So he spoke to us by his son. Remember the parable of Jesus Christos? When Jesus Christos says that there were husbandmen and they were left behind like the religious leaders and they, and they try to take over the farm, you know, and do their own thing. And when he sent the son, and he said that they would perhaps reverence my son, the husbandman re recognized, and this was the heir, they sought to kill the son. This is what the fascist invasion of Ethiopia was. It was an antichrist, a, a, a satanistic hit job against his imperial majesty that martyred several, you could say, several generations of Ethiopians were those martyrs. And once again, we have the book of Revelation opening up when it says those in the white robe garments. So we have an actual testimony to that. But the world and nominal Christians and pseudo-Christians and others look the other way to their detriment. But here it says that, that he hath in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he hath appointed ear, or the warash, the ear of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now it goes on to say in Kutur uh, um, Source, verse 3, it says, Arsum, Yekabrua menas barakena, the Bahiriua misalehono, Huluna besilt anuk al iye de gefe. Now, 
It says, who being the brightness of his glory, being the illumination of his glory, the brightness of his glory, and the express, you get that right there, the express image, the direct image of his person, the direct image of his person, and upholding all things by the word, the word of his power, the Sultanuk al Hulun, all by his word of authority. When he had by himself purged our Hatiyat, when he had purged, I remember this is in particular. This is speaking to the Hebrews. This particular doctrine of purging the Chatiyat, the missing of the mark of the Beta Israel, because Israel must be restored first. The lost sheep of the Beta Israel, they must be restored first in order for salvation and blessing to come to the Gentiles and to the world. I mean, this is a very important now. It's because the lost sheep or the, or, or, or the Beta Israel, the so-called Jews or the black Jews and Hebrews rejected the Moshiach. This is one of the reasons why we and our ancestors get slaves in the Americas and the Caribbean. A lot of Negroes don't like to hear that, but that's just the gospel truth. It says, when he hath by himself purged our Hatiyat, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So who is the Gurmao Kain? The Gurmao Kain. That the sun sat down on the right hand, at the right hand of his father. So it's very important for us to understand. A lot of people will say, well, the father and the son is one. Yes, in spirit and in truth. But here clearly it is showing that the son being the sun sat down at the right hand on high. You understand? On high, the most high. On high, the right hand of the majesty. Otherwise, are you saying the majesty is a thing and not the father, not the God and father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, whom we have even here a clear um a clear and an evident setting forth of in the person of the King of Kings, of Kedamawi, Haile Selassie, and his Christ. So it's important for us to understand the mystery of the Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but the one God, you understand the one God, which in former times was the Jewish or the Hebraic Trinity. So some more to come on this important subject matter. You understand, understand the revelation of Jesus Christos and the person of Ketamawi, Haile Selassie, the revelation of Jesus Christos, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the person, a vindication of the true gospel of Christ and the true example of the walk of Christ. Haile Selassie is that example and demonstration, and it's, 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 it's a shame, and it's sad, and it's a, it's, it's a woe that the world and the powers that be um, have rejected that example. More to come, my brothers and sisters, so stay tuned. Shalom Ras Teferi.